Our whole purpose in life is to make systems that just scream fast uh, for our deep folks that are doing deep learning training. And um, we, uh, our solutions span cloud and on-prem and hosted environments, but our, our main focus is performance. And so um, what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is how we're using DDN to make sure that all of the training runs that we run are never IO bound. And when you're investing half a billion dollars in, you know, in infrastructure to do your deep learning training, you don't want bottlenecks. So uh, let me grab this. So we're facing some pretty interesting constraints right now in the industry. Um, GPUs are severely constrained. Uh, getting that supply chain to work, um, getting the networking in place is, is hard. Uh, 22, 36 week lead times on some of these things. Very limited allocation from NVIDIA. And so what we're doing to try to you know, make sure that we're getting the best of a bad situation is we've collected some of the best HPC engineers and the best engineers from GPU uh, kind of configurations, NVIDIA themselves. And we've designed solutions uh, and, and kind of pre-fit the supply chain to make sure that we're getting everything fast and we're getting a really highly performant environment out of it. What I want to emphasize is that, you know, this is not traditional HPC work. Um, I come from, you know, a couple of decades of HPC work, and I've had to relearn a number of things as we've kind of adopted this new AI-based approach to HPC learning. And, and I'm not talking about, like, the bolt-on GPU HPC learning, um, which, you know, we see a lot of uh, in, in our requests from our communities today. It's like, you know, I need a ton of cores still and I'll throw it a GPU in. Um, the, the audiences that we're serving are the ones that don't even care about CPUs. It's like, I need, I need GPU memory and that's it. And I need GPUs to talk to GPUs as fast as possible. And so, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different design paradigm, but interestingly enough, IO is IO and it will always bottleneck if you don't think about it. And so, you know, we've done a couple of things. One is we've designed our technology and our data centers to really maximize throughput. Um, our data centers today um, start at 50 kilowatts per rack. Um, the ones that we're building right now for next year um, are 100 kilowatts per rack and liquid cooled. And, and that's a requirement or you can't host NVIDIA's next generation GPUs. So kind of a different world that uh, we're trying to be prepared for. Um, the next thing is making sure that the tools and the fabrics and everything work together. Um, just to give you an example of, of why this is important. Um, the, the, one of the technologies we use uh, from DDN is, is what's called GPU Direct RDMA. It effectively allows me to take the little pieces of data that I need to train my models and shove them directly from the storage device into the GPU without going through the CPU and, and PCIe fabric. And so really dramatic speed improvements, uh, you know, eliminating the GPU from that. But if I don't match my storage environment speeds to the speeds that I can chunk things into the GPU, I'm losing time on the GPU now. And I mean, these GPUs, they're $22,000 a piece. You put eight of them in a box. Um, you don't want them to be non-cycling. Um, and so, um, you know, making sure that that fabric, the storage on the end of the fabric, the fabric in between GPUs, and then working with the tools to make sure that I, I've actually got the right performance levels. Uh, just to give you an example of, of how that matters, we just built a 4,000 GPU cluster for one of our customers. And um, one cable in that environment was switched ports with another cable. And it caused a 7% performance loss on one of our tests. Now, 7%, you're kind of like, well, that's no big deal, but they paid us half a billion dollars 
you know, so 7% was material. Um, and, you know, we needed the expertise to go through with the tooling and figure out where those ports were wrong. Um, and ports, ports get screwed up all the time. You know, everybody knows that, especially when you're connecting that many different machines. Um, the next one is kind of dealing with the shortages and whether that's GPU shortage or networking shortage or even storage shortages, um, understanding what is critical and what is less critical as we're making trade-offs in that supply chain is, is important as you're looking at these designs. And then bringing in somebody that's done it before is you know something that we highly recommend. Um, let me talk a little bit about storage in particular and why it, from a performance standpoint, really matters. Um, when you're talking to machine learning engineers, when you're talking to data scientists, the work of actually getting data into a model that you can inference in, a, in an application or use you know, in internal processes, et cetera, about 70% of the work happens over here in data preparation. It's a, it's a lot of effort. And it usually requires people that are very familiar with the data itself. When you're dealing with this type of environment, this is you, there's some tools that could, are GPU accelerated here, but for the most part, what you're really looking for is just really persistent and, and, and solid storage. It just doesn't go anywhere. You can collect the right metadata on, et cetera. When you finish that work, and, and, and we use we use Dataflow as the management platform and IntelliFlash as, as the storage platform for that. When, when you've got your data ready to do the actual deep learning work, then you move it into that high-speed environment that I was talking about. And we consistently are using the A3i um, solution from NVIDIA, the Exascale solution, as, as what we call cache storage. In, in a distributed training run, what you have is at the beginning of the run, you have a lot of reads. And depending on the type of model you're doing, it might be the exact same stripe 4,000 times at the same exact instant. So parallel really matters. Um, and that read process loads all of the GPUs. They start doing their work. You also are loading the models. And as we are working with large language models, some of these new generative models, those model sizes are significant too. And, and being able to pull those as quickly as possible into memory um, uh, really benefits the startup process. But then as you're running, two things are really important. There's a misnomer that um, AI workloads don't write very often. Um, you'll hear it a lot. Um, it's wrong. Um, in today's world, um, especially with LLMs, um, it is becoming almost balanced. As a matter of fact, some of our workloads are seeing a 60-40 write to read ratio. And why is that? Well, it's because of these two pieces right here. When I get to extremely large models, what they're doing is they're exchanging the statistics in between the GPUs that each neural network comes up with. Your brain does this and we don't even know it. Um, like you know, when I, my, I've got a six year old daughter, when I watch her like seeing something new for the first time, what her brain is doing is comparing that instantaneously to a hundred other things like it that she's seen before. And she, in her brain, is actually statistically evaluating how similar this new thing is to all of the other things she's seen and categorized already. Deep learning training is doing the exact same thing. Each layer in the neural network is grabbing that likelihood that this is the same thing and passing that to the other GPUs, the other neurons in the brain, to see if they agree. And if a bunch of them agree, then it believes it's mostly right and it passes it to the next layer. And so these GPUs really benefit from a storage layer that can check all of that information and keep it in case the whole system goes down in the middle of it. Because to get to that little piece of statistics, sometimes you're at months of compute time and you don't wanna lose that. 
And so you've got that exchange that happens, and then you also will checkpoint the entire system at once. So you're capturing all of the weights, all of the progress across every GPU and pushing that to storage. In, in the past, where we were working with you know, 40, 64, or even 100 GPUs, checkpoints didn't re really tax storage very much. You know, most of our systems today start at 2,000 GPUs. You know, we're, 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 we're working with a customer right now on a 32,000 node design. Writing is gonna be really, really important, okay? And so, you know, 32,000 concurrent writes 10 times a second, um, you need a parallel file system. When you're all done getting your model done, and this could be hours, it could be months, um, then you run into a different storage paradigm and you're kind of back to where you were with data preparation, where you've got to find a way to replicate the model, version the model, distribute the model, maybe many hundreds of times across multiple contents, continents, and, and you want to make sure that every time you run through this, that your application is using the latest and greatest. Okay, so think of it a lot like a software uh, release cycle. This is your final code that you're releasing into the wild, and you really want to make sure you're treating it like code. And, and that's it. And that's, you know, we, um, I, they got me on a quote here somewhere that, you know, why do we choose DDN? And they're really simple and they're really fast. Um, you know, so it's, it's like the McLaren. Um, I don't get to pick much, but it works every time, and I get to pick really cool colors. And, but that's why we choose DDN over and over again for that, you know, for these environments that are mission critical where speed and scale matter. So thank you very much. Thank you.